This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. In early summer of 2020, I received a phone call from Stoney asking me to meet him at a hotel just outside Winder. He simply said, I have something I have to show you. When Stoney arrives, he's carrying with him a large wooden chest and a mason jar full of whiskey. As we enter room 220, he locks the door behind us and places the wooden box on the bed. While I'm setting up my audio equipment, Stoney takes several large swigs of whiskey and begins to tell me his story. Well, my dad come home and he was dressed up and asked me to crawl up under the house for him. And I was scared of spiders. And I said, I was about eight. I said, Dad, I'm scared of spiders. He said, hey, man, spiders out there. Do this for me. So I crawled over the house. I went to the pole where he said. I took a lift and I found the tip of a rock and I pulled it up and there was a bag of money. He said, don't look in it. First I got done was look in it full of money. That was of my childhood was what led me to come to find something else that I'd never told anyone. The old wooden chest that Stoney brought with him sits inconspicuously at the foot of the hotel bed. It's crudely made, and there's an iron clasp on the front. Sean, boxes like this I like because when I put something in the box like this, or either a satchel that's old, I know that it's something that's precious to me, and I don't forget what's in it. Now, when I put it in a box like this, I furthermore put it in a garbage bag, and then furthermore put it in something fireproof. This box is probably 50 years old. Inside the box of mementos are stacks of old newspaper clippings, odd-looking crocheted stuffed animals, and crocheted picture frames that Billy Burt made with family photos inside. First thing you see, and the date should be on here. That's a picture of my mother, my father, my son Stone, Stoney focuses his attention on a picture of his son, Stone, when he was a baby. Billy had made the crocheted picture frame and used a piece of clear cellophane to represent the glass. And the way he made the picture, it couldn't be taken out, so you never would have suspect that it could be, you know, look behind him saying, I had this thing for 20 years. And one day I'm sitting in my office and it, I don't know, just dawned on me how he was about, uh, mysteries and I felt of it and it felt thick and it hit me why would he make these to where you could not get into them I finesse and finesse and finally get one corner and look under and lo and behold there's a letter with I see his ink marks on it (laughs) and I'm so intrigued that I kept finessing to make sure I did not harm the the beautiful little frame he made with Stone's picture in it and finessed that out. When I read the letter, it was to his descendant, something to the effect of, Stone, I hope this is you to find this letter, son. If you you are, your papa is probably dead and gone, maybe even your daddy. So I turned the letter over on the back and it's a detailed map. And I recognize everything on the map is where we were raised at. I know every road, every creek. And I noticed he'd have an X and, and crosses. And upon studying it, the X's were points like some white rocks were stacked up and an intersection. But everywhere there was a cross, there was no reason for it. But three of the crosses was on the Mulberry River, right there where he was raised. See those crosses? Those are the intriguing things. But if you find an X, that just marks the location of a point to get. Only crosses are something to dig. Yeah, there's several crosses here. There's several X's too. This is as real as Blackbeard's map. I asked Stoney, what do you think he might find if we were to dig at one of the X's on this map? He says maybe money or jewelry his father stole. 
maybe guns used in a murder. And we might find a body because the mulberry was his place for bodies. I don't know, Sean. I don't know. From Imperative Entertainment, this is In the Red Clay. My father never really let him go to the dark side any more than he did Uncle Bobby or Don Cooper or Charlie. With Otis, it wasn't because he didn't trust him. He just didn't feel like Otis had what it took to, you know, wipe it from his mind. And Otis always wanted to be the one to pull the trigger. He wanted to be, well, he wanted to be Billy Burt, looking back on it. And my dad would always tell him, son, ain't what you think. And it proved out to be true because the one time that Otis even witnessed a cold-blooded murder, it, it took a toll on him, and that was to be his downfall. Otis Reedling was the youngest member of the Dixie Mafia. He joined Bert at just 17 years old. Billy loved him and tried his best not to let young Otis get too deep, no matter how much he pleaded with Billy to let him pull the trigger on a hit at least once. He was just as close to me as one of my uncles. And uh, of course my daddy loved him and I loved him. He was married to my daddy's sister's daughter, so he was uh, my daddy's nephew. And uh, so had therefore he's in the family. My daddy took up with Otis when he was about 17 and uh, he come to learn that he could be trusted. Billy would bring Otis along on jobs that weren't really dangerous beyond the possibility of getting arrested for burglary or arson. Otis was with Billy on the night they robbed the jewel box, a jewelry store situated in downtown Winder. Larry Evans was a, and Brookshire's was the two jewelry stores in town. Larry Evans had come out in the paper that week that he was expanding his store, and it even told in the paper about the remodeling and all. Well, my dad had cased this everything in town at one time or another, and back then, burglar alarms was real simple. You could tell when they was working when they wouldn't. Well, during this expansion, he had his burglar alarm off, had no choice. So, my dad got Charlie Reed, Sonny Lee, Otis Ridley. And the, the night they robbed the jewelry store, they robbed Peskins also. Come through the back where our initial was, and uh, they cleaned the jewelry store out. Now, my father never took jewelry to keep, even on somebody that he, on a hit, or, or somebody that uh, had got killed with him. He made a point, never take jewelry, because the jewelry was just a dead end street. It would get you caught, and it wasn't worth the time. So when he robbed the jewelry store, he told them plainly, don't keep a damn thing, not not a ring, not a necklace. Well, Otis being young, you know, like he was, he slipped a damn, pretty damn a ring into his pocket. Otis laid low for the next several weeks after the robbery. In the first day, he wore a diamond ring that he kept from the jewel box heist. He was spotted in Belk's department store at the Holly Hills Shopping Center in Winder by none other than Larry Evans, the owner of the jewelry store. The shiny diamond ring on Otis's hand immediately caught his eye. He went straight to the phone. They had Otis picked up within the hour. Otis no not talk, so you know, he wouldn't even give him his name hardly. So my daddy come down there and got him out. Trials in two weeks. He said, Otis, you tell them that uh, when they ask you where you got the ring, tell me you got it from me and I'll take it from there. That's all you need to know. Otis was on trial for burglary and possession of stolen goods. And when he took the stand, he did exactly as he was instructed. He said he bought the ring from Billy Burt. Jim West was there and all the law were. And at first you would have thought it was a break in the case. Otis was ratting or something. But it soon turned into something different. 
Dia, he doesn't see my father standing in there. So when he got through with notice, he asked him, he take the stand? Yeah, he would. So he swore my father in. Once on the stand, Billy began to make a mockery of the court. When being questioned by an overzealous district attorney named Nat Hancock about how he made his living, he had the courtroom laughing uncontrollably. Mr. Burt, would you state your name for the record, Dean? Billy Sunday Burt. In your occupation, I'm a farmer. Sir, is it true that you uh, sold Otis Reed in this ring on one month ago on the day of so-and-so? Yes, sir, it is. Hmm. Well, now, do you realize that you have just incriminated yourself? He said, well, no. Where'd you get the ring? Well, I got it from Willie Hester. Oh. And that was when a real rumble up to the courtroom because Willie had been missing for a little while. About six months. Water in the court. He said, uh, oh, really? You got it from Willie Hester. Can you tell us how long ago that was? He said, about two weeks ago. Do you know where Willie Hester is now so we can uh, get him in here to cooperate this? I won't ever forget that. He said, uh, no, nah, I ain't seen him in a couple weeks, but if I see him again, I'll tell you he's looking for him. And a deputy was sitting there, I don't remember his name, but he... <laughs> immediately laughed. He didn't mean to just come out of him. And uh, damn Jim Willis' face was red as a firecracker. Billy knew that saying he bought the ring off of Willie Hester was a smart move. Because Willie had disappeared and hadn't been seen in several months. The only way the police could question Hester is if they could find him. And as it would turn out, that was highly doubtful. It was sort of funny that deputy because he knew what had been missing. Well, that's when it got kind of funny. Looking back on it, funny, but at the time, well, I guess it was, the judge got laughing. Nat Hand got, got hot. He said, I tell you, you said you was a farmer, Billy Burke. How many cars you have? And my daddy thought a minute. He said, uh, well, I got four. He called off what they were, Tornado, Station Wagon, Cyclone, pickup truck, I believe. And uh, how many kids you have? Five. And you said you was a farmer? Yes, sir. He said, you expect us to believe that you're coming here dressed like this, wearing diamond rings with all these cars and five kids, <laughs> that you uh, make your living by farming? He said, well, yeah. DA says, let me ask you something. What do you farm? My daddy said pigs. And then that was uncontrolled by for that. Laughing, the judge got bad bang, ordered the court. D.A. said, really? Do you expect me to believe that? How many pigs do you have on your farm right now? And I don't forget this. My father sat up for about 20 seconds counting like he was counting a big volume. And the D.A. was matter in hell, the judge was matter in hell. And you imagine what Jim West was thinking. But most of the local law enforcement were having a ball because it was sort of funny if you know the whole story. And after counting on both hands, he said, 11, and that courtroom just erupted the laughter, and the judge even started laughing as he was banging for order. Otis was convicted of possession of stolen goods and sentenced to serve time at Stone Mountain Penitentiary. He would get out on an appeals trial after serving seven months. Bert openly flaunting that he wasn't to be intimidated or deterred by the police, the courts, or the federal agents, made Jim West's blood boil. If ever there was a moment in time that West made a conscious decision to do whatever it took to get Bert, this had to have been it. West, who usually traveled with Jack Barry as his driver, found himself driving alone one summer night in 1972 when he happened upon Billy Burt. This might be the only opportunity West would have to force Burt into a showdown, one-on-one. -on -one. And when opportunity knocks, you answer. He's riding down the road in his truck, and my dad didn't believe that Jack Berry was with him. Jack Berry was honest. 
Jim West was a crooked son of a bitch. And every police, sheriff, law enforcement, okay, will tell you that he's a crooked son of a bitch. He had in his mind he was not going to be able to get him. He's going to take him out. I don't know where he thought for the good of what all, whatever, he was going to take him out. West pulled his car up next to Bert's truck while they drove down the road and started shooting wildly at him. Got him in the arm. The truck turned over. Well, the guy that was in the car pulled over and looked back, and I guess he thought he killed him. He left. Boy, did he mess up. No reports were filed. No ambulance or tow truck was called. No arrest was made. West left Bert for dead. And when Bert's truck was found the next day, that's exactly what the newspapers reported, that Billy Bert was dead. Dad stayed gone for a week. He immediately called my mother, told us he was okay. Now, my dad was a private man. There had nobody to come to his house. The sheriff of Barricada was Howard Austin, a very respectful man. But he had been coming there every night and bringing these agents, talking to my mother about having heard. Well, I guess my father got a bait of it because he called the sheriff four nights after that. And he said, look, I'm okay. Don't be back at my house. Don't talk to my wife no damn more. And I hung up. On a warm July night in 1972, not long after West's failed attempt to assassinate Bert, he would once again have a run-in with the law. While on his way home, he saw blue flashing lights in his rearview mirror. He was tired and had no whiskey or anything else implicating with him, so he decided to just pull over and see what the officer wanted. After all, sometimes the best way to hide is right out in the open. Now, he didn't stop the law, any law, ever. Hardly. I mean, he just wouldn't nothing if he just outrun him. But this one night, a state patrol stopped him, and he knowed he wouldn't, that dad had nothing on him worth, worth mentioning. And so he pulled over. He was headed home to state him. When he state patrol stopped him, was talking to the window, he seen a pistol that had slid out under the seat, the floorboard. And he said, uh, can I run that pistol? When he said run it, he meant run the numbers. But they said, sure. Seven so run it, and they come back stolen. Billy had won the gun a week earlier in a card game from a man named Lamar Metcalf. But the serial numbers on the gun was showing it as stolen. So the officer arrested Billy. The gun was taken to the evidence locker at the police station, and Billy was taken to jail. Jim West might finally have his man. What happened, the year before, Lamar had misplaced it, and he went down to the city jail and had reported lost or stolen. Well, he had found it the next week, but he forgot to tell it, so it was showing that away. Well, when the rest of my father, Lamar come down the next morning and explained to the sheriff, or the chief of police, I think it was uh, Gerald Thomas, and they dropped it. But Jim West being now involved in the case, and ATF, anything that had to do with guns or murder, he had to say so on. So he picked it back up, wouldn't drop it. And then he took it a step further. A few weeks later, his father-in-law, Mac Lee, that's the same man that was with him when he committed his first murder on the banks of the Appalachian River, had taken the gun out of Billy's truck and gotten arrested for public drunkenness on a Friday, something Mac Lee was prone to do from time to time. When he was arrested, the sheriff confiscated the gun and placed it in the evidence locker at the courthouse. On Saturday morning, Billy went to the station, and the deputy told him that it was locked in a safe, and he couldn't get the gun back until the sheriff was in on Monday morning. But Billy knew he must get that gun back, at all costs. And it couldn't wait until Monday. That pistol had just been used in a double homicide over in Winterville. It would only be a matter of time before Jim West or someone else matched the gun to the murders. So, he came up with a plan that would make even the most hardened criminal question his logic and sanity. He rounded up a few of his boys, 
Charlie Reed, Sonny Lee, and young Otis Reedling. They went into that damn courthouse right yonder, put blankets on every window. Now, that's right between the city police station and the county, right between them, and the GBI headquarters right behind them. Went in there with a pair of settling torches on his back. They first tried to get in the vault by going through the DA's office upstairs, but they ran into reinforced concrete floor and they couldn't get through it. So they, and they couldn't cut through it because dynamite would just explode, you couldn't cut it. So they went back down there and they had brought a damn Frigidaire pasteboard box, folded best they could. The reason they took that box, he knew that he, to run a torch, it's real bright. And even though they had blankets on the window, it show light. So what he done, when he went to cut in that walk-in vault, they put that paperboard box around him and that cut the glow. He cut into the vault, went in there, got his gun. And while he was in there, he seen all this evidence. It was a week full court. So, you know, he had that devil in him. A, with no particular evidence he carried about in there. But also sitting in there was a cash box that had $1,500 in it. But he took the torch and just, just burnt the hell out of the evidence. What he didn't take with him. And they couldn't have court that year. Many, many people walked. The files then were all by paper. And if you did, if you lost them, you lost them. There were no duplicates. That was a big deal back then. There's a lot of people, a lot of people he made friends with over that. The robbery and destruction of evidence made the local news, of course. And when Jim West found out, he was livid. The theft of the gun was a huge slap in the face. Billy Bird had broken into the courthouse in his territory, right under his nose. The chance to nail Bert had slipped right through his fingers, and he hadn't even known it until it was too late. But Jim West doesn't give up that easily. He was too close to just let it go. He knew Bert wouldn't have risked breaking into the courthouse, situated right next to the GBI headquarters, if the gun wasn't important. West would find some way to get him. The gun was the key, but how? West dug through Bert's criminal record, looking for a link. And he stumbled upon an arrest in 1960 that might just be what he needed. That is when he stepped over the line and indicted him in federal court for having that firearm after being convicted of felony. But he had never been convicted of felony. Bert and father-in-law Mac Lee were apparently arrested in 1960 under suspicion of stealing a boat motor, which was a felony. Possession of a firearm after being convicted of a felony carried a hefty prison sentence. He had hired a lawyer out of Gainesville named Thompson. I remember him like yesterday. And Thompson was defending him. And the truth was he had been picked up in Dublin, Georgia in 1960 when I was just a baby. And they'd held him about six months about a, something to do with him and my grandpa, Mac Lee, about a boat motor. But they had to let him go for lack of evidence. Well, Jim West had found a retired deputy down there to agree to testify that he remembered a trial and remembered him getting convicted. And on that testimony, back then, that was as good as a court transcript, I guess, because they convicted him on it. The day before they convicted on him, after three or four days of testimony, my father smelled a rat in this, uh, in this lawyer, Thompson. And one day at recess, in the hall, outside of the bathroom, he caught Jim West talking low into lawyer Thompson's ear. I will never forget this. When the court convened again, he walked in there, he stood up, he said, right there in open court, he said, Judge, I want to fire this son of a bitch right now because they throw me in the well. And the judge hit his head. It be language like it in this courtroom. And what does that mean, throw you in the well? I just seen him in the hall talking to Jim West. I want to fire him right here and defend myself. Well, he was allowed to fire him right there on the spot, but the damage was done. Uh, the next day, they found him guilty and a judge sentenced him to two years in the federal penitentiary. Billy Sunday Burt was sentenced to two years at the United States Federal Penitentiary in Atlanta. Jim West finally had his man 
where he belonged. Now all he needed to do was connect Bert to at least one murder, and he could keep him there. But that would prove harder than he expected. Now, West couldn't even pay people to talk. And with Bert in prison, the rest of the Dixie Mafia had come to a grinding halt. Proof that if you cut the head off the snake, the body dies. With his big brother in prison, there was no one left to keep Ray Bird in line, and he quickly resorted back to his old ways of drinking and bullying. But sooner or later, your past catches up to you, and life has a funny way of dishing out karma. And that's just what happened on the night Ray walked into Tooney's place, a small honky-tonk where he liked to shoot pool. Short of it was, a guy named Daryl Doster, he got in an argument with Ray's father-in-law, and Ray had one over there and just gave him that famous one lick and laid him low. Got him up, washed him off. They Ray set him in there and bought him a beard, and everything was fine, he left. When that guy went home, came back 30 minutes later with a nine millimeter, when he walked into the door, jukebox on his right, the pool table Ray was shooting on was right in front of it, six foot in front of it, sort of to his right. Ray had his back to him, bent over the table. He was shooting that damn ball when they shot him in the back. That guy started shooting and shot him three times before Ray dropped to the floor and tried to pull himself under the pool table. And he just bent down and kept shooting till he ended it. Well, one of the bullets pierced his heart and killed him on the spot. The song, Burning Love, had only been out two months. <laughs> Every, all of us was crazy about Elvis, you know, but that song in particular, Ray really liked. And he'd go to the jukebox over there, when I, and he would play that three or four times. He'd been playing it all evening. Ray's favorite song, Burning Love, was still playing on the jukebox as he lay on the floor, dead. Ray MacArthur Burt was killed on January 27th, 1973. Just a few weeks before that, he had confided in young Stoney that he was going to stop drinking, fighting, and running around with women other than his wife. He had decided that it was time for a change, time to grow up, to be a better husband and father. But that epiphany seemed to come just a little too late for Ray Burt. But it wasn't meant to be any more than it was for my dad. If I could go back, both of them, I've always thought about what both of them told me about straightening up the month before they were picked up. Matter of fact, I used to fantasize about going back in time to that moment. It's kids will. That's about it. That's all I could think to say to them. They were what they were. They are just like me and you are. Some things, uh, some things you can't change, but to a kid, fantasizing, I guess is a way of coping. If I were to tell you some of my fantasies, you'd think I was crazy about going back. I've often thought, when I see a movie about going back in time, if I could go back to this year or that year, or this year or that year and say, tell them what's coming. But I ain't thought that way since I've become older. You stay that way a lot though. And this is when it happened. This is when I noticed something in Stoney I hadn't seen before. Something monumental. By now, I had known Stoney for almost a year since starting work on this story. And by large, he told the stories of his father's exploits like he was recapping action scenes from his favorite movie. There seemed to be no real emotion in his voice when he talked about the people his father robbed were murdered. It had a sense of all in good fun or a 
boys will be boys mentality. He was disconnected from it somehow. But I was conditioned. I was conditioned. But that was beginning to change. As I dug deeper into events like Floyd Hoard's murder and the jewel box heist, and interviewed people that were on the other side of these horrible crimes, for the first time in his life, Stoney was forced to come face to face with how his father's actions affected people on the flip side of the coin. He thought about how Larry Evans, the owner of the jewelry store, nearly lost everything when Billy robbed him because apparently he wasn't insured. That man practically had to start again from scratch. Now looking back on it, I'm sure that cost Larry Evans some real hardship. You know, my dad was, when he taught me, don't ever steal, son, but, but if you ever get hungry and you can't feed your family and you have to, let it be from somebody with big money or something insured. Don't ever steal from a poor person, a man you work for. So I'm sure he thought Larry was insured. And if Larry wouldn't insure, like I heard him tell my father he wouldn't, I can see that costing his family some real hardship. But at the time, I never thought of it that way, as I'm sure my father didn't. He began to get emotional, rubbing his hands together nervously. I could tell Stoney wasn't used to showing emotion or vulnerability to people. At times, he would tear up and ask me to cut my recorder off. Like when I played Richard Hoard's interview for him describing his father's murder. And though Billy wasn't guilty of that murder, Stoney began to make the connection between that and crimes his father was guilty of. I have never heard the graphic details of just how horrible a murder like that is. Never. And when I first heard this, it caught me off guard. Me and my son was listening, and it grabbed me immediately when I heard Mr. Horry's voice because I could feel in his voice the same way I feel when I talk dearly about the father I love, a kid who has a good father. He is no equal than that person, and I felt love for me. And it caught me off guard, and I had to stop and uh, wipe away some tears. Up to that point, it's easy to just say, they killed the DA. And you don't have to look at anything other than that fact. I can relate to actually seeing it by listening to him, which he did see it, and worse. And what really struck me was, I'm listening to total innocence. A 14-year-old whose father was took from him the same way mine was took from me, but for totally different reasons. His father was took from him by the cruelty of this world for trying to be a good man to help his fellow man. My father was took from me for being on the other side of that coin. And I don't know, it just sort of humbled me to the point to where I had to rethink my whole thinking concerning both sides of the coin of my father and everything that went down in this era. This is this particular story heard from Mr. Horde's own mouth has affected me more than anything has affected me since my father's death. It really has. And I have prayed and thanked God so many times since I first heard this that it wasn't my father that done it. And if it had been after hearing that, I don't know I probably have to have three for the rest of my life. I just, just, I don't know what else to tell you. Ah, it just don't come anymore. Pitiful. It 
It's become hard for me to listen to this man, trying to come to grips with these feelings he's tried his best to shut out. Over the past year, I've come to care about Stoney and his family. They're good people. Polite, respectful, giving. Stoney didn't ask for this to be an inescapable part of his life, but that's the hand he was dealt. And you might have heard Stoney mention his father's death. Yes, Billy Sunday Burt is dead, but his story is far from over. In the Red Clay is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was created, written, and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote and created the original music score. Executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Story editor is Jason Hoke. Produced and engineered by Shane Freeman, Jason Hoke, and myself. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. Voice sessions recorded at Tree Sound Studios, Atlanta, Georgia. Archival footage licensed courtesy of Brown Media Archives, University of Georgia, and WSB-TV in Atlanta, Georgia. In the Red Clay is a 12-episode series with new episodes available every Tuesday. Follow us on Instagram at In the Red Clay Podcast. Have questions? Email us at podcasts at imperativeentertainment.com. If you like the show, tell your friends and leave us a review. Thanks for listening.